if we can finish this. All right, the Cold War it's oversimplified. And it was a they copyright strike all the videos and don't let us monetize them, which is fine. Um, but that makes me think that they're backed by the CIA and all the largest corporations and arms of the empire. And that's why they're trying to stop us from making fun of their stupid Cold War videos. Um, but that's not going to stop us because we're not in this for the money. You know, we're not the, we're not in this for the fame and glory. We're in this for the education, the communist and Marxist education and the organizing. So we're going to make fun of this video and debunk this silly lie that socialism has failed every time it's tried, been tried. And we don't care that we can't put any ads on it because we're real communists. Let's run it. Of laughs. Today, the president walks among priceless treasures from China's golden age. Among them, a pair of ear stoppers used by the emperor to keep from hearing criticism. Oh, Nixon. Everything was going great for Nixon, until it was uncovered that back home he was being a very naughty boy and violating constitutional protocol. I'm announcing today my resignation as president, and I'm passing the office to my vice president, Gerald Ford. Wow, you mean in America the people can actually remove their leader when he breaks the law? Why not just rule by force? Where's the corruption? And my first act as president is to pardon Nixon. Ah, there it is. After the whole fiasco, Americans decided what they really wanted was just... At least they somewhat admit that America's corrupt. But America just lies about it. That makes it worse. You know, and we have legal methods of corruption. Literally, the Supreme Court legalized bribery with Citizens United. Um, allowed corporations, campaign donations, money that they give um, politically to count as speech. And, you know, because you have freedom of speech, they have freedom to donate as much as they want. Just a nice, safe guy who wouldn't cheat on them. So they elected Jimmy Carter, and the two sides met in Vienna, where they signed yet another strategic arms limitation treaty. It's an honor, Premier Brezhnev. Likewise, President Carter. Please don't do that. But that's not to say there was no longer any tension between the two sides, because there was. Heaps of it. Once again, the Soviet Union put down further attempts at reform and rebellion in the Eastern Bloc. The Euro missile crisis saw new and improved classes of intermediate range missiles being deployed in Europe. In 1979, the Soviets thought it would be a good idea if they had their own Vietnam and invaded Afghanistan to prevent a US sponsored Islamic. I hate these people. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan invasion was not the soviets vietnam you're out of your mind and whatever freaking crazy death toll you come up with for afghanistan was largely caused by the united states funneling arms and weapons to the worst the absolute worst extremist groups in afghanistan the osama bin laden and his mujahideen which splintered into al-qaeda were funneled arms at this time, and those arms have remained in the region to this day. The arms that the U.S. funneled to the Mujahideen have allowed extremist groups to remain armed in this area and remain active in this area to this day. That's how many arms the U.S. sent there, and um, it's allowed the ETIM, this this um, extremist group in uh, eastern Afghanistan, or they're located in a few places, but one of them is, is Xinjiang, China. And the U.S. took them off the terrorist listing recently um, because they are a separatist group in Xinjiang and they, the U.S. would like them to destabilize China um, or commit attacks that destabilize China. And this is a group that's running around with guns that the U.S. sent to Afghanistan um, during the Soviet-Afghan war to fight communism. And what was the Soviet Union doing there? I mean, that was when the Soviet Union was there it was the most ha hopeful time in Afghanistan's history. Um, I mean, you can support uh, their interventionism or not. And now China doesn't do stuff like this anymore. Right. But um, uh, <clears throat> but we have seen Russia do stuff like this, like in Syria, where they sent their troops. But um, the Soviets were trying to help set up a democratic Marxist left wing government of social reformers who wanted to move Afghanistan in a progressive direction and who had a systematic plan 
uh, for economic construction and electrifying the country and building power plants, um, water sanitation facilities, uh, you know, means of production, upgrading the means of production um, and bringing Afghanistan out of its sort of feudal state. And But because there were so many extremist groups, so many different political factions, the Soviet Union eventually, um, after 10 requests from uh, the Afghans to, to come and help them, the Soviet Union finally said yes. After 10 requests, uh, was there helping them, not only helping them stabilize the country um, amidst the fighting and the various extremist groups, but also helping them with economic construction, helping them build hospitals and schools. And that's when the U.S. started funneling arms and weapons into Osama bin Laden's Mujahideen, who later splintered into Al-Qaeda and did 9-11, to which the U.S. responded by invading Afghanistan, telling, telling us that they needed to invade Afghanistan to fight the war on terror. When the supposed terrorists that we need to go fight were armed by us 20 years earlier, to fight the Soviet Union who was uh, helping the Marxist Democratic government fight terrorist groups and build hospitals. Uh, we gave Osama bin Laden a bunch of weapons to fight against that or to stop that. Um, and, and to act like what the Soviet Union was doing was the same as the U.S.'s massacres in Vietnam, which left their soil and, and farmland filled with toxic waste and napalm and Agent Orange and made it difficult um, or, you know, destroyed their infrastructure and made economic construction a monumental task, which is amazing. You know, it's a testament to the Vietnamese people that they've been able to rebuild themselves today. You know, but Afghanistan has not been able to rebuild themselves. They've um, continually been, been held in poverty and destitution, uh, first by the U.S. backing of right wing extremist groups and then by the U.S. invasion and occupation. Um, so it is not the Soviet Union, um, who has, has destroyed Afghanistan or stopped it from having economic construction and in no way can their invasion, um, be compared to Vietnam, no matter what you think of it, you can be against the invasion totally on principle. You know, you should say socialist countries shouldn't do this. They should be completely non-interventionist like China and just have a foreign policy of mutual development and trade. Um, but to, to act like this is the same as Viet, you know, the U S is butchering in Vietnam is just absolutely ahistorical. Insurgency. And in response to these various crises, Olympic games were boycotted. Conservatives were concerned that U S policy had become too soft. And in 1980, they decided they wanted a president who would be tough on communism. So they elected Ronald Reagan and Reagan came in guns blazing. Concerned at the Soviet Union's human rights violations, he made a speech calling them an evil empire. And he also wanted to renew the arms race using technological... Remember how we said capitalist uh, talking points or accusations against socialism are just projection? Ronald Reagan called the Soviet Union an evil empire uh, before he went on to give a bunch of... Um, arms and weapons to the the Contras, the paramilitary death squads in Nicaragua, and among a, a bunch of other things I'm sure we'll get into here. ...advances in computing and lasers. He came up with the Space Defense Initiative, also known as Star Wars, which was basically a big defensive anti-nuke shield around the country, but a lot of people thought it was a pretty dumb idea. The Soviet Union perceived this shift in rhetoric as the USA getting ready for war, and they were feeling especially threatened as their relationship with their communist ally China had broken down. Relations took a big hit in 1983 when the... Yeah! Yeah! The you know, Soviet split! Every time I, the Sino Soviet split comes up in history, I shed a tear. And I sing, Why can't we be friends? The Soviets shot down a Korean airliner that had strayed into their airspace, and it looked like the world was going right back to mid 20th century Cold War tension. But then Brezhnev got really old and died and was replaced by this guy who was really old and died. And... I mean, the Sino Soviet split was a lot more complicated than that. Um, the Sino Soviet split largely came down to the fact that Mao um, and others in China thought Khrushchev was a revisionist. Um, and there were a lot of academics um, in China, a lot of academics who today we would criticize as ultras or ultra left Maoists, 
um, who were calling the Soviet Union social imperialist, which obviously was a term that the CIA was like, yeah, even China says the Soviet Union's imperialist. Look, um, so China made a lot of mistakes during that time, I think, uh, even in their foreign policy, or especially in their foreign policy. They also backed Pol Pot um, at one point. Um, so, yeah, but a lot led to the Sino Soviet split, more complicated than they're making it out to be. But this is an oversimplified video, I guess. I just wish they would mention economics once or production or class struggle. But alas, this was made by liberals. It was replaced by this guy who was really old and died, and he was replaced by Mikhail Gorbachev. Boo! Into office. Boo! Boo! In 1985, he was the real game changer. His philosophy differed a lot from previous Soviet leaders. He felt that the reason the Soviet system and economy was struggling was that it didn't allow the Soviet people to find satisfaction in their work because... Unlike capitalism and the workers at Pizza Hut. They weren't allowed to speak freely and lived in fear. Gorbachev wanted the Soviet people to be happy, but unlike pre... So he brought them Pizza Hut. Previous Soviet leaders, he actually made the change happen. Within the first couple of years, he began the political movement for more openness and transparency and the restructuring of the Soviet political and economic... Perestroika. This is the main thing. I mean, there is no openness. Oligarchs took over the country um, after Perestroika. Because if you allow capitalism into your country in an unrestricted way and you sell off a bunch of your state industry, uh, nationalized industry for pennies to multinational firms, your government is going to start to become corrupt and overtaken by oligarchs. And China understood this when they went ahead with their market reforms and opened up to private capital in certain areas, which is why they've had many anti-corruption campaigns to root out the um, influence of capital or capitalism in the party or in their government or in their party cadres. Um, so, yeah, but that's not what this was, you know, and, and the idea that by allowing, you know, unrestricted capitalism into your country is going to give you openness in your government is laughable. But Gorbachev knew that he was just corrupt systems and change Ivan. very quickly took effect. People could criticize the government. They and, and he really, really liked Pizza Hut could enjoy Western pop culture. The media interviewed Margaret Thatcher, but most importantly, the Soviet people could now enjoy pizza. I told you, this is the most important thing. Um, this is why the Soviet Union fell, really. Um, Gorbachev is basically Pizza the Hut from State or Spaceballs, but in real life. All hail to Gorbachev. He also knew that the arms race needed to end in order to rescue the Soviet economy, and a positive relationship with the West must be established. Constructive dialogue reopened and resulted in the INF Treaty, which saw all... I mean, and, and that is kind of true. Like, that's what we've seen China do. And now that China's more self-sustaining, um, they're, you know, being bullied by the U.S. less and less. But they always have a policy, have had a policy of mutual development with the U.S. since Mao, you know, since um, as they talked about in this video, um, Nixon and Carter went and visited China and made good relations. And some U.S. firms invested in China um, after the uh, market reforms and opening up. But China's always said, you know, our relationship with the U.S. is one of friendship. If they attack us, we'll defend ourselves, you know, and we are prepared to defend against imperialist attacks and we'll do what we need to, to protect our national security. Uh, but they've always tried to create good relations, whereas the Soviet Union is the first socialist experiment, always pitted themselves, you know, against the empire. Literally, like Stalin is saying um, in in his early writing, like, the first socialist country will be a base of operations for, you know, the revolutionary proletariat. And then they can help spread socialism to all the other countries until we have world communism. So the U.S. capitalists were probably reading this and pooping in their diapers like, ah, here come the socialists. You know, they're they're actually going to take us over because uh, that was actually the plan. And then China comes up with um, and, and not to say they were imperialist in doing it. Right. They just wanted to. Um, <clears throat> pursue economic construction, help revolutionary movements in the global south, which were widespread, which um, and the, the Cold War, the actual fighting largely took place in the global south um, between liberation movements being backed by the Soviet Union and right wing paramilitary death squads being backed by the U.S. Um, or, or just the U.S. invading. 
um, in the case of Korea, Vietnam, and others. Uh, but but ultimately, I think what the, the Soviet Union needed um, at this time was a, a policy more similar to China, you know, one of mutual development. Um, we're going to we're going to uh, create stronger economic ties with China, with Vietnam, with Korea, with every socialist country, with Cuba. Um, and we're just going to focus on our own economic construction and kind of ignore the U.S. Uh, but obviously there were internal contradictions within the Soviet Union by the time they got to Gorbachev that like that wasn't possible. And they weren't even thinking, you know, rationally in the interest of socialism at this time. There were a lot of people within the country fighting to save socialism and fighting to not let Gorbachev allow gangsters and oligarchs to plunder the country and the socialist system like he did. Um, but, you know, there were also a lot of uh, gangsters and oligarchs and, and corrupt officials um, who wanted to to do what they did. So intermediate range missiles eliminated, which was huge. Reagan's tone towards the Soviet Union began to soften and things were looking up. But what would these reforms mean for the Eastern Bloc? For decades, the Soviets had been brutally suppressing any attempt at change. Now, would they be allowed? And that was the exact question on Hungary's lips when the prime minister visited Moscow. Gorb no, the Soviet Union wasn't controlling them the way that the U.S. Um, has portrayed it. These countries were extremely independent in their economies as well as their their politics. And it was a human rights disaster for every country. The dissolution of the Soviet Union led to mass unemployment um, the disintegration of their social welfare programs, uh, increases in malnutrition, uh, drug tra drug trafficking and sex trafficking flowed back over the border and hadn't been there for years. Um, and then Yugoslavia, or at least parts of Yugoslavia and Serbia, held on to their, uh, uh, their socialist system for a while, uh, despite IMF and World Bank infiltration. And the U.S. carpet bombed them for it destroyed their infrastructure, their nationalized infrastructure, while leaving all of the private infrastructure unbombed, um, bombing the socialist headquarters, um, two different socialist headquarters, destroying a lot of the agriculture um, and farmland, uh, destroying the socialist system by force. So it was a human rights disaster for these countries after the Soviet Union fell. Um, the Soviet umbrella fell from Yugoslavia, leaving them open to horrific bombing. Um, and the other countries had their socialist uh, economies plundered by multinational corporations, which led to uh, a human rights disaster in pretty much every country. Gorbachev's response, he didn't necessarily agree with the reforms, but he wouldn't stop them either. He was prepared to let the Eastern Bloc choose its own future. This was massive, and the Hungarian leaders began planning free, multi-party elections. Poland followed suit and also held elections in June. The anti-Soviet party, Solidarity, won 99 out of 100 seats in the Senate. But not just that. In Hungary, the barbed wire border between East and West was removed. The Iron Curtain was unraveling. But not all Eastern Bloc leaders were happy. Notably, East Germany was still ruled by a hardline Stalinist, Erich Honecker, and many East Germans were still eager to get out. They had been trapped by the Berlin Wall, but now they were doing the math. If they could travel to Hungary, and Hungary's border with the West was loosening, could they now make it to the West? That summer, East Germans decided Hungary was the latest top holiday destination. They traveled there in droves, and using various methods, tens of thousands crossed the border into Austria and the West. Honecker was furious, and Bloch traveled to Hungary, but that civil liberties train had started rolling and it wasn't stopping. Thousands more flocked to the West German Embassy in Prague, where they stormed the fence around the embassy gardens and a temporary refugee camp was set up. In September, deals were struck to allow the refugees to travel. This was all, I mean, even Naomi Klein, um, who wrote the book Shock Doctrine, who's criticized Venezuela, you know, for using oil um, to fund their social programs or has made all sorts of, you know, different, different criticisms of existing socialism. Um, is anti-Marxist uh, in her her book Shock Doctrine when she's talking about this specific color revolution or this specific coup? And I don't know it that specifically, um, so I'm just going to point people. Or I don't know it that well, the ins and outs of it. So I'm just going to point people towards Naomi Klein. Um, but even her, a social democrat who says you know compares Marxists to religious fanatics in that book, in in the part about this coup. Um, even she points out how deeply involved the CIA was and how deeply involved USAID was and how many U.S.-backed NGOs there were uh, facilitating this. 
and facilitating this color revolution because there were a lot of people who didn't want to give up the socialist system still um, because it afforded them a lot of protections that they especially uh, people in East Germany understood that because they saw West Germany. You know, and this cartoonish characterization that you've seen in this Cold War Simplified video was not true. And people in East Germany knew that socialism provided them many economic protections that people in the West did not have. You know, they had these these state run industries that would offer them a job at all times uh, versus the West had unemployment. The East didn't have sex or drug trafficking. The West did. Um, the West had hunger and homelessness. Uh, the East was able to get rid of those things via socialist economic construction. Um, so, yeah, there were a lot of people who wanted to keep the system. And, and the same is true in Russia and in uh, every part of the Soviet Union. West by a train. Back in East Germany, the people were running on a civil liberties high and they wanted their next hit. Dissent was growing. Over time, demonstrations turned to mass protest. A civil liberties high? Is that what you call it when the U.S. incites a riot? Um, and, and uses NGOs to fund a bunch of extremist groups or fund opportunist imperialist segments of the uh, major workers' unions um, and basically take over those unions. Uh, was it, uh, were, were the um, fascists in Ukraine uh, who helped turn Euromaidan into a violent coup and, and burned tr a bunch of trade unionists alive? um in a, in the trade union building in ukraine in 2014 who were being backed by the u.s state department uh were they just getting high on civil liberties is that what those nazis were doing with plainclothes secret police officers doing their best to put down the dissent but it had grown well out of their control and worse the biggest demonstration was yet to come we're going to put all of this down by force right guys guys Unfortunately, everyone had realized what he had not. This was bigger than them, and the entire East German Politburo voted him out of power. On November 4th, over half a million East Germans took to the streets of East Berlin. For many, there was... I literally um, don't know that much at all about Honecker. My, my Europe history, um, East Europe history especially, has gotten better. My West European history needs to get more betterer. Um, but Europe was a, a blind spot for me forever. Um, and I have gotten better. But this period, I'm not super solid on uh, um, as far as like, honestly, 70s, 80s, 90s, um, Eastern and Western Europe. Um, yeah. Still one big target left in their sights, that damn wall. The pressure on the East German government was too great. And on November 9th, they made a bit of a chaotic announcement that the travel ban between East and West was being lifted. The change wasn't meant to take effect until the next day, and crossing guards still had orders to shoot on sight any who tried to cross. But that night, huge crowds gathered at the crossing points, and the guards were overwhelmed. In an astronomically historic moment, after decades of family separation and travel restriction, the people were allowed to pass through east and west berliners is there a video of this couldn't believe it and celebrated together throughout the night some even climbed the wall and began to topple it the iron curtain had fallen and a year later germany would be reunited elections in bulgaria a peaceful revolution in czechoslovakia and a violent one in romania brought i mean and if korea were reunited I think no matter the conditions, there would be people around the DMZ, right? The demilitarized zone that had been split for years. Um, but how do we know that those people were celebrating capitalism and that they were celebrating the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of communism? I mean, there were video cameras at this point. Why didn't they show any videos or interviews with people? I don't know. Maybe it's just so oversimplified. Can't get into it to an end communist authority in the Eastern Bloc. America decided it would be best if it just stayed away and let the change happen, as the anti-communist movement continued all the way back to Moscow. Gorbachev had given the people the freedom to demonstrate. Now, they demonstrated for an end to the communist single-party rule, and Gorbachev had to give in. For the first time in history, elections were held in which candidates not officially endorsed by the party were allowed to run. Ambitious rival- And there are also communists and socialists, a lot of them Marxists, who have read like 800 different opinions on why the Soviet Union fell and what was going on. I've read like two, um, which you'd think is a lot of books to read about a subject, you know, two books, you know, quite a bit, but 
not compared to most Marxists. And there's a there's differing opinions about it um, between, um, you know, even like some of my favorite people who I respect and who I know agree on like most stuff. You know, they come to different conclusions about why the Soviet Union fell, which is absolutely fine, you know, and, and it's great to have uh, those kind of discussions. Uh, but, you know, basically internal and external contradictions. Like peop some people try and say it was all imperialism. Some people try and say um, it was all reformism. Uh, people on the inside, corruption and reformism and the bureaucracy got too big. Um, I think all of those things are partially true. Um, but also you have the external contradiction of imperialism. And the U.S. was continually trying to erode the socialist system, um, overthrow uh, the socialist governments, not only in Russia, but in Eastern Europe, all the Soviet governments. Um, and, and the external contradictions incited, inflamed uh, the internal contradictions. So, you know, you have internal contradictions like a bureaucracy that's that's become detached from the people. Um, in various ways. Uh, so you have various corrupt politicians who have sort of lost mostly their connection to the proletariat and are looking out for their own interests. And then you have external, con the external contradiction of imperialism of the U.S. State Department, you know, trying to find corrupt politicians within the Soviet Union to work to take it down from the inside. Um, so that's just an example of how the internal contradictions work together with the external. Um, but yeah, I, I think the one thing to try and avoid when talking about it is just like absolutism. Like, you know, it was only imperialism that took down uh, socialism in the USSR. You know, it was only reformism. It was, the, it started with the reformist Khrushchev, like, uh, you know, um, there, things are not that simple. You know, there are a lot of different factors which lead to a historical event this massive. Of Gorbachev, Boris Yeltsin led a growing democratic movement. Now things here get quite confusing, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union is a complicated topic. So believe me, this is oversimplified, but it went a little bit like this. The Soviet Union was made up of a number of smaller Soviet republics, the largest of which was Russia. Yeltsin got himself elected the president of Russia, and began a struggle for sovereignty against Gorbachev and the greater Soviet Union. Communist hardliners were- Oh, uh, uh, boo! We also boo Yeltsin. Boo! I didn't want to boo Gor Gorbachev and then forget to boo Yeltsin. Horrified at what Gorbachev was allowing, so they briefly kidnapped him and tried to set up their... The Hardline Communist Club. Everybody who wanted to overthrow the government and dismantle the socialist system undemocratically in the USSR, they were good people who were getting high on civil liberties. Uh, but everybody who wanted to keep the socialist system that they had built um, and that their their the past generations had built for them um, and the system where people weren't in poverty and where they uh, ate as many calories as they did in the U.S., but healthier food overall um, and had universal health care um, and didn't paid one percent of their their wages and rent um, of their their total income and rent, whereas in the U.S. we pay 20 to 50 on average. All the people who wanted to keep that. You know, it wasn't because that made their lives better or it made them more more secure, their families more secure. They were just hardline communists uh, who would wear weird black wigs and, and red stars on their chests and Harry Potter glasses. And they would run around and do do communist crimes. And they would say, we're hardline communists. You know, so no matter how democratically a country supports communism, well, uh, or no, um. We're hardline communists, so I don't know. I don't even know what kind of joke I was trying to make there. Um, but either way, this is accurate. This is what all communists look like and what they do. Their own emergency government. But Yeltsin and his supporters all gathered around the White House in Moscow and were like, no, we have a tank. So the hardliners had to concede and released Gorbachev. Wow, thanks, Boris. That was a close one. No problem. And thanks to you for all the great freedom you've given us. Any time, pal. And just to inform you, I've used that freedom you've given us to go behind your back and make a deal with Ukraine and Belarus to dissolve the Soviet Union and set up the Russian Federation. In other words, you're no longer in charge. I am. Dude. So uncool. And so this actually kind of shows what I mean by the internal contradictions playing themselves off the external contradictions. So you have... Um, the a power struggle going on, you know, even between Gorbachev and Yeltsin 
um, both looking to play the U.S. off each other, making the, you know, looking to make relations with the U.S., um, probably to become the U.S.'s man on the inside, you know, to become their uh, Zelensky or whatever, their puppet leader. So, uh, um, yeah. And so decades of tension and the everlasting threat of nuclear war finally came to an end as democratic governments were established in many of the old Soviet republics and the world. Democratic oligarchies. Like, I love how Americans simultaneously, like, talk about Russia as the world's most corrupt place. And Russia is the world's worst place and they're all evil and their country's just run by oligarchs. You know, we're, in the U.S. we have billionaires, but in Russia they have oligarchs. Um, it's different for some reason. Uh, but then they also say that Russia is a democratic republic. So if capitalism so great and our democracy so great, why did they immediately become an oligarchy when you dismantled socialism? When you sold off all the state-run firms to transnational corporations and Western CEOs and banks, why did their country become an oligarchy and not a perfect liberal bourgeois democracy, democratic republic? It's because you were never instituting democracy. You were dismantling um, the forms of democracy that they still had. You were dismantling absolutely their economic democracy. And, and selling it off for pennies to transnational corporations who then exploited the country and uh, corrupted the country's government. Um, and yeah, and we continue doing that till Putin, um, who's renationalized a lot of the, the major um, industries or, or the major sectors of, sorry, uh, major sectors of Russia's economy. Um, including major parts of the energy sector, which is largely what has caused the U.S. to start hating Russia again, um, as well as Russia's support for uh, countries like Syria um, and Iran, who the U.S. is trying to overthrow. Uh, but yeah, somehow Russia is an oligarchy, uh, but they're also a, a liberal democracy, um, and they're also still communist, according to Americans got along together forever after right guys <laughs> look at this screen cap this is hilarious i didn't even mean to do this i kind of want to take a picture of this Oh, yeah, look at them. The goats. Hey, this, this modern art thing is growing on me. Where can I learn to do that? Skillshare. Skillshare is an online. And now they're advertising modern art. Typical. Typical. 